Support for WGCU's local productions comes from the estate of Patrick and Rosalie LaSala and from generous contributions by viewers like you. Thank you. Vets, stories of service sponsored by Shell Point, Florida's premier resort retirement community located in Fort Myers, just minutes from Sanibel and Captiva Islands. Shortly after being uh, uh, weapons tested at Eglin, uh, uh, they sent four of us with some special weapon systems, top secret in those days, to Ubon, Thailand, and, and that's where I flew uh, until I was shot down. Most of my missions were not walleye missions. They were just general missions so I could get adapted to combat. In any event, it was uh, one of those special missions where they actually shot down two out of the four of us because we came in low. It was January 68, January 18th, 68 when I was shot down. I knew it was hit, but I kept it going to get to the Gulf of Tonkin. And that was some, you know, 60 miles away. It took me maybe 15 minutes to get to before I could see the water, thinking I could make it and then eject. And it was pretty low. And before I could get there, the plane just went inverted. In the F-4, when you punch out, there are two. So when you pull, you eject, one seat goes before the other so you don't hit each other. And so it's a pretty simple process. And they, thankfully, the McDonnell Douglas built that into the process. So when we both got out, we, it was pretty obvious that when we turned upside down, we were gonna go out, so. I was shot down at 3.30 in the afternoon, to basically time over target, and by uh, dusk, they uh, tracked me down and uh, captured me and uh, stripped me naked and paraded me, uh, you know, for hours it seemed like. And it was about two days later I finally made it to Hanoi. Other than cuts and bruises and, you know, I was not injured. I didn't have any broken bones, so I was very fortunate. They put me in a place called the Plantation out of the old Wawa prison. The first thing was the beatings and torture and trying to have your right sorts of confessions. And then I was placed solo for months and months. Honestly, I, it was just uh, totally in uh, dismay, despair. How did this happen to me? I had this whole thing going, you know, on my way. Uh, and it took I think it was six or eight weeks before I take me to the bathhouse. And then all of a sudden, I hear the first American voice in weeks and months. And he says, hey, new guy, get on your knees, get down to the drain. And he was yelling to me through the bottom. But he gave me the code for the tap code, five rows, five columns, the C and the K are the same. So that's how we communicate. We did pass down a lot of policies. They were in place because they wanted to make sure that our conduct was in line with the military code of conduct for prisoners of war. When you're interrogation, when you're beaten, and how you, uh, what you, you know, how you get through that, how you don't didn't want to compromise yourself. These things gave you a little latitude of how you could skirt the issue somewhat and still live through it. Probably the most important thing is we all had to memorize, put them in alphabetical order, any POW that had ever been known and where they were in the, you know, so we passed that along. If you're released early, I think that's pretty solid evidence that you, you haven't honored the code of conduct. But there was one fella, he was 19 years old, he was a seaman, 19. He wasn't shot down. He fell off a destroyer in the Gulf of Tonkin. So Doug Hegdahl was told three times and he refused to take early release. That guy, had been rounding up all the names, 350 at that time, 
phone numbers, wives' names, kids' names. He refused to go until he got all the names and numbers. They moved me out of a place called the Plantation along with others up into right on the China border. And believe it or not, the United States didn't even know we were there. And it was right after the peace agreements were signed, they put us on trucks and brought us back and said, what, what's going on? We didn't know the word in it. About a week or so later, they put us on trucks and took us to the airport <laughs> on a bus. So anyway, we get out to this uh, tarmac at the airport, Jalam, and the bus turns the corner and I see this airplane. One circling to land, one's on the ground. And as soon as it turned the corner, got off the bus, somebody grabs my arm. And I'm in a Air Force uniform. <laughs> Get on. <laughs> they didn't stop. You know, just landed, didn't stop, put me on, walk on. And the next thing I'm reading a magazine, a newspaper, take off. And three hours later, I'm in the Philippines and they're at the hospital. So it was an interesting day. I grew up in, on the south side of Milwaukee, a uh, typical blue collar neighborhood. All our fathers and uncles were World War II veterans. And that was the era we grew up in. Although we thought we were pretty savvy kids, in our own neighborhood we were, but we weren't very worldly. But we did start paying attention to Vietnam. There was a draft and we all knew it. And the kids in my neighborhood, we didn't go to college. Uh, when our time came, we went in the military. And in my case, I joined the Marine Corps. And that would have been the very beginning of 1968. In the Marine Corps, we were all going to Vietnam. You couldn't imagine what it was you were going to. We were all young, tough guys, and that whole platoon did go to Vietnam. Most were infantry. I was trained as a radio operator in an infantry company. We landed in uh, Da Nang, which was a large air base, and then from there we took another flight north to where our company was headquartered out of. That was a city called Dong Ha. They kept us there for about five days just to get acclimated to the heat. Then in a few days, we helicoptered out to where our company was. It was an infantry company and we were out in the bush, as we called it. Well, our first job was behind a, it was a medical unit, almost like MASH would be on TV. And behind there, there was a pile of clothing about the size of a small car. And our job was to go through the clothes these were all wounded and killed in action. Well, that was a real eye-opener for us because some of the trousers would have legs missing and a gaping hole in the back of a shirt. And I remember the guy that I was with, he said, God, he said, I hope we're not going where these guys came from. Well, the guy that was heading up this working party, he said, that's exactly where you're going. You're their replacements. We got into something that you can't even imagine. There's no way to even articulate what it was. And although, looking backwards, the Marine Corps tried to prepare you for it, and they did the best they could, but there is no preparation for that. As a radio operator, I was the communications between what we were doing and back at headquarters. That was our link. That was our communications. You know, we did what the Marines did over there. We went out on daytime patrols, nighttime patrols, night ambushes, listening posts. The DMZ was the demilitarized zone which separated North Vietnam from South Vietnam. The entire 3rd Marine Division was in that area and they were all mobile infantry companies. So we were on the move a lot. It was an area that was thick with North Vietnamese soldiers. A lot of battles went on up there. Hae San was a famous battle that lasted 77 days. I wasn't involved in Hae San, but a lot of those hills had been fought for many times and then abandoned. They'd be taken, abandoned, 
months later you might be fighting for the same hill. At the time, we weren't aware of all the politics that were going into this. We were fighting for survival. Well, the Marine Corps motto is Semper Fidelis. The translation is simply always faithful. You're faithful to your country, your Marine Corps, but more importantly, the Marine to your left and right. You're fighting for each other. You're 19 and fighting like hell to make it 20. As Marines, you go where the Marine Corps tells you to go and you do what you have to do without question. That may sound foolish to a lot of people, but that's what the Marine Corps was all about. A lot of veterans came home with deep feelings of guilt. And most of it is survivor guilt. Why did I, how did I come home and these guys didn't? Well, there's no way to know that. It's not, it's not because the survivors fought harder or were smarter. It wasn't anything like that. That's the, that's the way of war. Some make it, some don't. But <clears throat> as a survivor, it's our duty now to tell the story of these guys. You can't forget all these men. And their story, I think, simply was they were average young men who, when their country called, they went. And they fought as valiantly as any warrior in history. I was flying in the Air Defense Command in uh, Massachusetts, and we learned about the Vietnam War and they needed people. So I went to a personnel officer and I said, I want the next assignment that comes into Vietnam. And I got it. <laughs> in 1963, I was stationed at Nha Trang, Vietnam. We were an experimental unit, one of McNamara's dreams. We had about 10 airplanes and maybe 12 pilots. At that time, of course, we were basically embedded with the Vietnamese and advising them. In my case, I was teaching Vietnamese pilot. They weren't pilots yet. I was teaching them to be pilots. The first tour, I was there for one year, and then I came back to the U.S. in the summer of 1964. I went back in 72, 73, and 74 flying F-4s, Phantoms. And this time I was stationed at Udorn Air Base in Thailand, Northern Thailand, and flying all over Southeast Asia. Near the end, uh, I was the operations officer, and that was a little more exciting because we had flights that started about 4 a.m and the last plane would land maybe 9, 10 at night. We were flying pretty much that schedule. As the ops officer, I was in charge of all the flying, of course, and <clears throat> during one period, we were flying 22 combat missions a day with a total of 17 crews. And that was tough, because they're long missions. Anyway, this one day I had flown in the morning, and I was back at my desk, and we got a call in for a very quick sortie to the Delta of Vietnam. Coming back, I flew across Cambodia and being so familiar with it, I saw a whole bunch of trucks coming down Route 13. And I said, that's very interesting. So I dropped down and took some pictures while they tried to shoot us up pretty well. But I got the pictures took them back and uh, they developed them and all hell broke loose. Uh, first of all, they're going to court-martial me because I wasn't supposed to be in Cambodia doing anything. <laughs> they had already put that off limits. And then they realized what the pictures I had taken were hundreds and hundreds of Vietnamese trucks, North Vietnamese trucks. So pretty soon the four-star flew in <laughs> And I was briefing him on what I saw with the pictures on the wing of his airplane, his, teeth, his transport business jet. He immediately took them, flew to Phnom Penh, 
and the Cambodians got all excited. Meanwhile, other Air Force assets were tasked to find these trucks and couldn't find them for two days. And I said, let me go back. I know where I saw them. I, you know, they, they only have so plenty places to go. Well, for two days, they wouldn't let me go back. Third day, I went back, found just the corner of a truck sticking out from under a tree, took it back, and the Cambodians actually went out in their T-28s and bombed it. This huge mass of trucks were hidden in a Michelin rubber plantation. And when the Cambodian Air Force bombed it, the whole plantation blew up. I think about war in general, it is not taught to our people, our school kids and anybody nearly enough because these are the most traumatic things that happen to any nation. And when only 10% or less of the people who live in a country actually have ever had a touch of the war, I mean, even their family members and so on and so forth, like our Congress, you can't ignore it. We'd like to, but you can't ignore it. And, and you've got to build that into your psyche and your planning. If you do that, we won't have so many wars. I graduated from uh, University of Illinois um, <clears throat> in the mid-year, January of 1966, and, and received a uh, draft notice 10 days later. And so I decided to enlist, because I had a college degree, and they had a, what they called the College Option OCS program. And um, if you uh, joined up, you could pick your branch. And so I joined up and picked my branch. And ever since I was a little kid, I loved tanks. So I picked armor as a branch. It was commissioned in 1967, February of 1967. What I got was a tour that everybody wanted in Germany. And I joined a tank battalion in uh, Gelnhausen, Germany. And, um, and then I rose to uh, the rank of first lieutenant, and but became a company commander, tank company commander. So I was in, in Germany and in a long tour and decided I wanted to go to Vietnam. Not so much for patriotic reasons, but actually because I wanted to experience it. And so um, I put in for a transfer and was turned down. So I ultimately wrote my senator. I was from Chicago and my senator was Senator Everett Dirksen. And I got a response from his office almost immediately. And they said, oh, absolutely. <laughs> and I received orders uh, 30 days later. And so I joined as a tank platoon leader, I joined uh, the 82nd Airborne. I ended up uh, commanding uh, Echo Company of the 1st, the 505 Infantry uh, in the 82nd Airborne. <laughs> The entire battalion was sent south and after Tet to um, provide security initially for Tonsonut Air Force Base. And then actually we ended up in an area just northwest of Saigon and uh, there was a big marsh there and there was a lot of Viet Cong activity there. But almost every night we sent patrols into uh, this marsh and because that was a primary infiltration route into Saigon. And these were small units, a squad, generally. My company, an infantry company, had a couple hundred soldiers in it, but there was very rarely ever a couple hundred soldiers. We generally operated with about 80 soldiers in the field. And so we would send out, a, you know, 10 to, 10 to 15 man patrols at night. The problem of soldiers being high on drugs was a continuing problem. And uh, I remember one particular time, we were inside the fire base, and uh, a soldier was totally stoned and was cleaning his weapon, an M16. And he jammed, I'll never forget this, he jammed 
the butt of the rifle on the ground and it went off and uh, he was holding it in his hand and he jammed it on the ground and it went off a full automatic and it shot his hand off right in front of me. As an officer, I found myself not trying to get too close to the soldiers that were in my company. I saw my job as trying to run the company and uh, the day-to-day -day of it. I didn't get too close to anybody. I came home and, uh, and actually traveled in uniform back. Oh, I, I processed out at Fort Dix and then um, got on, you know, flew to Chicago and um, had a terrible series of experiences uh, while I was traveling because there was a great deal of anti-war sentiment and, um, you know, I had people say th really nasty things to me and then lots of other soldiers did too. As I got home and, and s became a civilian and um, really did not talk about the war at all, I think my lasting impression was not so much of the horror of war, it was the waste of war. The Army had a program called Early Commissioning Program. If you signed up when you got into veterinary school, the Army would guarantee you that you would get to finish school. And so we were guaranteed that, and the Army was guaranteed a steady supply of veterinarians uh, to uh, support the war effort in Vietnam. I graduated in the spring of 1970, went in the Army that fall, and then the next spring I went to Vietnam. We were mainly in the Army to be veterinarians, but the, of course we had to learn how to be an Army person too, so they, we were sent to Fort Sam Houston in San Antonio, Texas for 30 days. And uh, there we learned how to salute and uh, we learned how to fire the M16. We had a little map reading, uh, that sort of thing, got our uniforms. Then all the veterinarians had to go to uh, meat and dairy hygiene school in Chicago for eight weeks. The veterinary corps, all, besides taking care of the, the dogs, they also, uh, they also are responsible for food inspections. We arrive in Saigon, and then as I remember, we go to the, the headquarters of the colonel, who is a veterinarian, who assigns captains like me uh, uh, to different bases within Vietnam where they need a veterinarian, where the, uh, the scout dogs were positioned. What the Army had was mostly scout dogs, which were mostly German Shepherds, and they were trained to go and lead patrols in the bush or in the jungle, and uh, they were trained to detect enemy booby traps or enemy personnel. And then we also had a few Labrador Retrievers who were trained as tracker dogs. At the height of the war, there were around 5,000 scout dogs, and uh, a typical scout dog uh, platoon would be about 30 dogs. I was stationed in Chu Lai mainly when I got there, but as the war was winding down, there were fewer veterinarians, so I traveled all over what we called MR1 and 2. That were the two military regions on the north. There were military region 1, 2, 3, and 4, and I, was, I traveled all over. From the demilitarized zone in the north down to Quinyan, which is a, a city on the, on the uh, South China Sea, about midway up in Vietnam, and as far west as uh, Pleiku. We took care of the dogs. We had, you know, a lot of maintenance, you know, uh, uh, take care of any sickness, lameness, uh, teeth problems, that sort of thing. And unfortunately, uh, a good bit of our veterinary time was taken up with treating wounds. You know, they were wounded uh, too, just like the soldiers. One dog uh, alerted on a North Vietnamese ambush, uh, and all of our guys hit the ground, and then the dog started out towards the Vietnamese and so that guy had to expose himself and he shot the dog and the bullet went in his back leg, shattered the tibia. Anyway, after he shot the dog, our guys got him and then a big firefight broke out. And when things were quieted down enough, they got the dog on the helicopter. He came right to my place, you know. And uh, so uh, he was in shock. We uh, drew blood from our blood donor dog, got him a blood transfusion stabilized him and then uh, the next day we uh, went in, pinned that leg, put it in a splint, a Thomas splint, and he did great. He went back into service before I left. Probably the worst thing that happened uh, 
these uh, troopers uh, in a helicopter platoon brought in this little puppy. And as soon as I saw him, I knew that puppy had rabies. I mean, he, he, had, he was snapping at everything. And they thought it was funny. You know, they were, you know, petting him and everything. And uh, I said, man, this is bad. I said, has this dog scratched or bit anybody or anything like that? And they said, yeah, probably so, you know. And so the commander of that helicopter platoon sent a helicopter to my office, picked me up, took me out there and, you know, and had all of his officers and uh, NCOs there. And we had a big discussion, you know, and I, I told him, here's what we have to do to contain this. There were 42 guys that had to take the, the rabies shots because of that, that little puppy. I recently read a uh, biography of Stonewall Jackson, and he was just absolutely against the war. But once it came, he was the fiercest fighter there was, you know. And that's probably, the, that's probably a good example for all of us. We should do everything we can to avoid war. But if we're in a war, let's win it. Support for WGCU's local productions comes from the estate of Patrick and Rosalie LaSala and from generous contributions by viewers like you. Thank you. To include WGCU in your legacy planning, visit WGCU.org.